Hello, and welcome to Pauks and Pros. My name is Ramsey. I'm an event staff at Pauks and Pros Bookstore, where we host in-person events along with partnered and supported events, trips, classes. For a full list of everything confirmed, please go to our website, pauksandpros.com. Before we get started today, I'd like to ask you to please silence your cell phone so as not to disrupt the event. When you give the time for opening the floor for your questions, we'll be passing around them. Oh, sorry. We'll be actually having Q&A right here behind this, this podium. Following the Q&A, we'll have a signing up here at this table. So if you have not already purchased the book, we have many copies behind the register at the front of the store. We'll ask you to line up and we'll come by to ask you for personalization. So please have your books ready for us. Once the event is complete, we ask you to fold up your chairs and lean them against something sturdy. So now, without further ado, today I'm very excited to welcome author Catherine Duvall, serving the release of Native Nations and Millennium in North America. Kathleen DeVoe is a professor of the History of Un University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, where she teaches early American and American Indian history. Her previous work includes Independence Lost, which was a finalist for the George Washington Prize in the Native Ground, the Indian and the Colonialist in the Hearts of the Continent. She is a co-author of Give Me Liberty and a co-editor of the Interpreting a Continent, Voice from a Colonial America. DeVoe will be in conversation with Armin Leon, Leon began his studying the history of Native people of Washington, D.C. after spending time in Australia, where the local indigenous people are celebrated. He returned to Washington, D.C. in 2016 and began asking about the Natives who once lived in D.C. He assembled his findings in his book, Native American History of Washington, D.C. Without further ado, please join me in welcoming Kathleen DeVoe and Armin Leon. Hello. Um, well, we're welcoming tonight uh, Kathleen Duvall, and uh, let's start off by having her say something about her interest in Native history and history with the topic. Sure. I um, the I started my career studying early American history, and um, I, I knew Native Americans would be part of that history, but I. Um, as I looked at documents and learned more about early American history, they just kept speaking to me out of the archives and, and saying that they were more powerful than I thought they would be, um, than I thought they were, and having a bigger part in um, my writing than I thought they would have. And, and I sort of, um, over time, uh, sort of became trained as a Native American historian. And so then I, you know, I, I went along and I, I wrote books that had a lot of Native history in them. Um, and then people would always ask me questions. They would say, you know, I see, I see Native Americans on TV. I, and they're, you know, they're in Congress. There are cases before the Supreme Court. Um, clearly, Native Americans are around today. And it seemed that people often couldn't, um, you know, couldn't bridge the gap between the sort of long history um, that that long ago history they might have been told of uh, Native Americans. Maybe declining pretty quickly, not having a lot of power um, over the 19th and 20th century, and the fact that clearly Native Americans are here today. Um, and particularly, I think, and this is one of the things I, you know, it's the title of the book, that Native nations are here today, that, um, that Native Americans haven't survived just as people, as individuals, as descendants, but that there are more than 500 Native nations in the United States alone today, not even counting the ones in Mexico, the ones in Canada, um, state-recognized tribes, so more than 500 federally recognized tribes alone. Um, and so one of the goals of this book, I think, is, is to bridge for people that long history. It's, it's a millennium, as the title says. It starts before Europeans got here. It starts about in about the year 1000. Um, and then really traces how Native nations were then and how they survived over that millennium to still be around today. Okay, uh, well, the, um, one of the big changes that uh, occurred in the Native history that you recount pretty well, very well, is the urbanization of life by the Native Americans. And then because of various factors, uh, that changed Drastically. Would you like to talk a little bit about that? Yeah, yeah. So the book starts you know, a thousand or so years ago um, in a time of where in North America there were um, major cities. There were um, cities in the Mississippian region, the largest being Cahokia, right across uh, the Mississippi River from St. Louis. Um, but there were other 
cities, large civilizations all across North America, um, all across uh, Southeast, the Southwest, um, that you can still today see the large mounds upon which many, many buildings would have been built at the time. Um, and so there's a period in Native American history, Native North America, where there are these um, large cities, large civilizations with very powerful leaders. And so one of the stories I tell, um, or long standing stories I tell in the book is the, um, how those cities fell. Right? The, there's a era where there's certainly climate change, sort of the reverse of the climate change we might be experiencing now, um, the change from what had been the medieval warm period into the Little Ice Age. So um, there's the medieval warm period. It was a period um, around 1,000, 1,100, um, when the planet was, was warm enough for agriculture to spread um, in the Americas from central Mexico into the north, and really large-scale corn agriculture um, spread across North America. Um, it's actually the same period in which, this sort of warm period, in which large-scale agriculture spreads to Western Europe from places like Mesopotamia. Um, so it's a, it's a global phenomenon in the northern hemisphere. Um, and that's the period when these cities were built, um, when Cahokia and other places like that were built. Because to have a city takes, um, takes having people who have time uh, to devote to other things besides, um, besides just feeding themselves. And, and um, so the cities rose in this period. And then as uh, the climate changed and the Little Ice Age um, began, and this were probably in the 1200s, but there, there's a period of climate instability um, leading up to the, the beginning of the Little Ice Age. And um, most of these cities across North America, they, they fell. Um, this is before Europeans got here, for the most part. Um, so it's a, an internal thing that happens in North America. And one of the things I tell in the book is how people, Native Americans, created a sort of new, different sort of way of life in the aftermath of the, the fall of the cities, and, and particularly the, you know, the, the inability of, um, uh, of large-scale agriculture to be dependable. Um, and so Europeans arrive um, in the 1500s and 1600s, and they look at Native American societies across North America, I mean, north of central Mexico, um, and see what to Europeans, uh, what Europeans describe, sort of try to think of as, as primitive. Um, you know, they hunt, they gather, they don't farm as much as we do. I mean, they certainly farmed, and Europeans tended not to see farming, as much farming as there really was. Um, and Europeans thought of this as sort of an earlier stage of civilization, that uh, Native Americans hadn't yet developed cities. And in fact, it's, it's quite different from that. It, Native Americans really across much of North America had sort of rejected that urbanized past and built a more sustainable, um, economy that was diverse, that integrated um, farming with hunting and gathering and trading, fishing, um, and that, and developed ways, uh, sort of ways of politics that, um, that supported that, uh, and particularly of diplomacy. Um, trade, for example, with other peoples might then provide um, sort of a safety net in, in a time when maybe your, your crops failed. Um, so, yeah. Well, I was impressed by your explanation of how large the, uh, oh, thank you, I'm sorry. The, uh, the cities that were built mm -hmm. on the mound across from St. Louis was uh, 90 feet tall. Was, uh, and uh, I, I've heard that St. Louis was once called the Mound City. It's, yeah, but yeah. It's, it's not, there are none of those mounds left anymore, mm -hmm. but right. it, there were and the, the extents of the mounds along the Mississippi mm -hmm. in right. that area. Yeah, so St. Louis was basically a satellite city of Cahokia, um, the main city, right, being east of, of the Mississippi and what's now Illinois. But St. Louis, uh, when Americans first got there, you know, in the 19th century, so centuries after that was a major city, centuries after it had uh, it had sort of broken apart, um, it still right was called the Mound City because there were so many mounds then. Americans in St. Louis bulldoze those mounds, so that's why they aren't there anymore. Um, but there's a period where sort of St. Louis's identity is partly tied to these mounds, and yet at the very same time, um, 
19th century Americans were imagining, like couldn't make themselves believe that Native Americans had built them. And so there's a huge debate that happens in the, in the late 19th century about who could possibly have built these. And you know, maybe they, they were built by glaciers and they're obviously not, they're like these, like they're clearly human made. And like, well, it was probably the Welsh or um, you know, something, you know, the Phoenicians. Uh, 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 my favorite is the descendants of Atlantis. Is it like their, their island uh, sank and then they came to North America and built mounds for some reason. <laughs> so, yeah. Well, you're uh, going to do a short reading, I oh, understand. Oh, yes, yeah. Yeah, I, was, I thought I'd read a little bit out of, um, it's, this is a chapter that's toward the middle of the book. It's after Europeans have arrived, but it's still when Native nations were in periods of, 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 of a lot of power, really still having more power in most parts of North America than Europeans had. Um, so this is, uh, this is one of the, the Mohawks' first encounters with Europeans. As the sky began to lighten, the enemy came ashore, and the Mohawk warriors came out of their barricade. The Mohawks were an impressive sight, nearly 200 of them, painted for war, with wooden armor and helmets to protect them from their enemy's arrows, and wearing their distinct Haudenosaunee, short feathered headdresses, which inspired terror in their enemies. The approaching Wendat, Algonquin, and Innu warriors let out a cry, and then did something unusual. When they were about 30 steps away from the Mohawks, they parted into two groups, leaving in the middle one man, covered in metal from his hat to his knees. As the Mohawks pulled back their bows, preparing to shoot their first round of arrows, they heard an enormous cracking boom, as if thunder and the sound of a waterfall had combined and struck for just a moment right in front of them. One of the Mohawks standing near the front fell down dead, shot right through his wooden armor. The enemy force shouted in delight. Another bang, another man fell. The Mohawks had never seen guns, and it was astonishing to see people fall without being hit by an arrow. And this is the point where in many traditional tellings, the way Native American history has often been told, the next paragraph will be about how devastating this is for Indians that guns arrive and they become dependent on Europeans or just sort of wiped away by Europeans advanced weaponry. But if you look closely at the documents and, and its oral histories and what they, they have said later, it, it's, it's very different from that. So I'm gonna keep, keep reading about what actually happens with a, with a caution about that. If we rush too fast through the 17th century, we might interpret the arrival of guns and metal-tipped arrows as the start of native dependence and European dominance. But we would be wrong. Local rivalries, customs, and geography continue to be the most important factors in native decisions and determine the opportunities and limits for Europeans. There had been new weapons here before and new ways of defending against them. When your enemy gains some advantage, you adapt it, and that is what the Mohawks did. And I'm going to skip ahead and tell a little bit about some of the things that Mohawks bought besides guns. Um, and this would be at Albany. Um, Fort Orange is the name of Albany. But that's um, Mohawks came to Fort Orange for the guns, but they stayed for the cake. When they visited Fort Orange, they sampled Dutch cakes, cookies, and bread, and took some home for others to try. The excellence of Dutch baking was universally rec recognized. The English word cookie is originally a Dutch word. To the frustration of many colonists, Mohawk's proceeds from the fur trade allowed them to pay high prices. The Dutch colonists who introduced white bread and cakes to the region soon found that they could not afford them. Colonists repeatedly complained to the New Netherland Council that the bakers sifted whole wheat flour and sold the white flour, this is a quotation, greatly to their profit to the Indians for the baking of sweet cake, white bread, cookies, and pretzels leaving largely bran to sell to the townspeople. The petition concluded in horror. The Christians must eat the bran while the Indians eat the flour. In an effort to appease colonists, the council outlawed the sale of white bread and cake to native customers. But as with liquor and with guns, native demand prevailed. Bakers continued, sending, continued selling baked goods made from white flour to their best customers, the Mohawks. And so this is just one example, and, and as you know, there are many chapters in the book that talk, about, and particularly in the middle of the book, that talk about um, the power that Native nations had in trade, in uh, sort of military alliances over Europeans. Um, 
and especially you know, away from the coasts where there weren't lots of Europeans, where there are a smaller number of Europeans. Right? It's a different story um, if you are sort of Virginia Indians who live very close to Jamestown, for example. That's going to be a, a, a sort of swifter um, interaction with, uh, with settler colonialism. But um, yeah, so. Well, as you point out very well, um, the storytelling that you do in the book is excellent. And the extensive referencing of documents that you draw from is also very impressive. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> but um, the um, uh, topics that um, I wanted to ask you about um, that you bring out in a lot of detail with a lot of the native uh, dealings in, among themselves mm -hmm. is the egalitarian structure of the Native American communities, which was far in advance of everything the Europeans had. Yeah, I think that's a really good way to, to think about it because there's sort of there's this very romanticized view of Native American societies as being, you know, they yeah, sure, they get along with each other because they're so simple, right? They're primitive. They they haven't yet developed more complicated structures. And it really and it, it seems very much the opposite from that that they um, in this era that we talked about before um, with the fall of cities, they and, and this is all over the oral histories of the descendants of, of, of urban spaces in North America, they created new kinds of, of politics, of diplomacy, um, to try to ensure um, that in times uh, where there wasn't plenty, when in times of, of trouble, um, there would be neighbors to rely on, other people in a society to rely on. So really across Native America, this um, a philosophy of reciprocity becomes dominant, of um, the idea that uh, you, um, in trade, for example, um, in, in all systems, sort of capitalist systems of trade, uh, both sides ideally should benefit, right? But you don't have an obligation to the other side. In reciprocal systems of trade that were developed in Native North America, um, there's an obligation to provide for your trading partner. Um, and you know, as, as Native scholars have pointed out, that means that you sort of are building up this kind of almost bank account, this, this wealth of uh, promises when you give um, that when you're in trouble, you'll receive, and, and it will be then someone else, you know, your trading partner's responsibility to, um, to reciprocate. And then that, uh, that has sort of a parallel in, in politics in, in many Native societies, and you know, it's certainly um, through the, the middle of the book, at least, um, when, uh, so for example, um, uh, there might be a, a, a war chief and a peace chief, so not just one leader, but two leaders who are really responsible for kind of, for kind of arguing things out, for figuring out what to do together, um, but then counseled by many other people um, who might also have roles that are particular to how what they're supposed to argue through, um, but they're supposed to reach consensus, and then on major decisions like going to war or making peace or, or moving a town, um, you're supposed to convene all the people, the men, the women, the children, and uh, and you know, maybe not everybody speaks, but everybody's there at least to listen and to witness and to be part of a major decision. Um, and so, yeah, these are complicated systems, and some of these, some of the sources that I draw on are oral histories, and some are documents, um, and then some are native scholars who sort of um, political philosophers who sort of looked into these systems and noted um, their complexity, and, and you know, just to have an egalitarian politics is is complicated. It is not a simple uh, political structure. And so I think, in, in, yeah, in some ways you could say that um, the movement toward democracy, or sort of, and, and, and this way, often a you know, consensus-based democracy, is much earlier in Native America um, than it is in Europe, when Europe at the time is still you know, full of kings and queens. And what about the important role of women in, in general decisions? and? Yes. Uh, Maybe you'd like to say a couple of words about that. Right, right. So gender is is central to reciprocity. So um, in many of these societies, women are responsible for the farming and the gathering. And gathering isn't just sort of randomly walking around looking for food. It's you know cultivating places that you return to seasonally with with things you can eat or use for medicine. Um, women responsible mostly for the 
farming and the gathering. Men were also responsible for hunting and fishing. Um, and those are reciprocal, right? One part of your society is in charge of, uh, of, of a complementary part of the economy um, rather than one being in charge of all of the economy, as some societies are, um, as we know. And then um, similarly in politics, right? Um, often when Europeans, if they paid any attention, to native politics or internal politics. They noticed male leaders. But what they usually missed is that there was usually also a female council. And the female council um, was more responsible for things like, um, like land use because they were in charge of, of agriculture. Um, or they were often in charge of how a town was laid out because women um, often, and these are huge generalizations, but women often were in charge of making the houses. Right? So, um, the women's council would be in charge of the sorts of things that women did, but the sorts of things that women did were just as important, though you know markedly different from the things that men were supposed to be in charge of. You talk about the success that the native tribes had with uh, diplomacy, especially when dealing with the European powers, and then things changed drastically after the American Revolution. Mm -hmm. Would you like to expand on some of that? Yeah, sure. So, so there's a the book has two parts, and it's a, the American Revolution is about the, um, the the middle of that, and there's a real shift in the book from um, times when you know centuries when either only Native Americans were in North America or when Europeans were relatively um, powerless, right? Had relatively less power than Native nations did. The United States changes that. Not immediately, um, but pretty soon. Um, in the 19th century, the United States um, sort of moves over the Appalachians, takes native lands between the Appalachians and the Mississippi, um, and then, of course, continues to expand in the West, um, particularly after the Civil War. And so there are ways in which native nations have to adapt to survive. Um, and so you know, the big sort of thread of the whole book is how, you know, how do Native nations survive this? And that is a much bigger question in the second half of the book than the first half of the book. The first half of the book, it's like, well, just obviously, they had lots of power, they had military power, they had demographic power, right? There, there are more of them. Um, those things change, right, after, you know, particularly in the 19th century and in the 20th century. Um, Native nations in various circumstances across the continent hold on in various ways um, and against great odds, not only sort of military power by the United States, but in the late 19th century and the early 20th century, which is really sort of the time period that is the hardest for Native nations to survive. We sort of think about it as being the period of Indian removal, um, but you know, which, is, which is horrible, and I, and I talk about it in the book, but when Native nations were removed to the West, um, they still had land, and they still had a, a sort of recognized national sort of sovereignty um, that they were you know, able to, with difficulty, rebuild. But it's the late 19th century and the early 20th century when white Americans really decide there really shouldn't be any Native Americans anymore at all. There certainly shouldn't be any Native nations left. Nothing with a with any sort of sign of, of any sort of remaining sovereignty or power, um, and and sort of. There are a variety of ways that Native nations develop to try to counter this. Um, on the East Coast, it is um, there's a lot of just sort of hiding under the radar. I see Warren Miltier here, and his work is just tremendously important in showing how um, Native communities on the East Coast they they kind of went into hiding. Some of them literally, sort of in you know in swamps and places like that. Others just by um, sort of retaining their um, sense of community to themselves while um, you know, sort of trying not to stick out too much, trying not to uh, um, to be entirely destroyed, and and then in other places, you know, places with with less pressure, um, you know, having their I mean le less sort of demographic pressure right upon them, um, having their children torn away from them and taken to boarding schools, and um, all the horrors of of the late nineteenth and twentieth century. Um, but there, you know, when you, there are kids who come home from boarding schools back to their grandparents, and their grandparents teach them the language um, that they may never know quite as well because they were, you know, torn away for years. But 
the cultures, you know, they don't die. They, they, they stay alive. And, and now, so toward the end of the book, I, um, there's, there's, there's a real renaissance today in Native America. In, uh, and I think this is an, another adaptation. There's a, there's a new sense of, of sort of cultural power um, with, uh, and that we see, you know, we see on, on television and in movies and, and ways in which um, Native nations, not just Native Americans, but Native nations um, are showing they, they survive, they're still different from each other, like clearly a priority for generations and generations of Native Americans was to remain not just Native American, but to remain you know, Chickasaw or Choctaw or, or Mohawk um, and not to give up those, um, those individual Native identi national identities along the way. Well, just to go back uh, a bit, because I found it quite interesting that uh, the diplomacy between the uh, natives and the European powers had the European powers providing uh, what was the word? Uh, they they every year they would give a right. um, donation. Yeah, um, yeah, right. So there are different words you can sort of use for a tribute or rent or things like that. But so so I talk about it in various chapters. But I have um, one chapter particularly on on the Quapaws. The Quapaws are a, a fairly small tribe um, just west of the Mississippi River in, in what's now Arkansas today. Um, and they, through diplomacy, were able to get the French and then the Spanish and then for a little while the British um, to really, yeah, to pay to be there, right? So you there are these European maps where Europeans write all across the map. You know, this is French Louisiana. This is British Virginia, right? Uh, this is Spanish California. Um, but on the ground, for you know, most of this period, most of these centuries, it's mostly Native Americans, mostly Native nations. Um, and so, if you're a French guy and you're sent off there up the Mississippi River to establish a post, and you know the French government, the French colony is pretty spread out. You get sent with ten soldiers, right? And you get out there, and there are six thousand Quapaws. You know, you're gonna. You're going to say, you know, my boss said I have to put a fort here and that this is French land. This is French Louisiana. Um, but yeah, they, uh, the Quapaws say, well, okay, that's great. You can have this little plot of land. Um, and we see you didn't bring any women with you, so you're clearly not going to be able to feed yourself. So we'll, you know, we'll, we'll trade some corn and other food to you. Um, but in return, we know what Europeans make and we want those goods. So, um, uh, every year, you know, you'll pay us a certain amount of, of tribute, really, of, of uh, or rent, or whatever you want to call it, guns and blankets and needles and axes, um, in addition to to the more day-to-day -day trade that's going on for furs. Um, there's, there's an extra payment on top of that that really is a recognition that Europeans have to make um, that this is Native land and they're there by Native permission. In some places, right? There are some places where that's not going on anymore. In the this is in the 1700s, and um, the uh, natives had enough uh, in their demand to affect markets in Europe right. in manufacturing. Right, right. That's exactly right. So there are guns that are made in Europe, particularly to um, sort of native uh, um, uh, specifications. Um, there are axes uh, that um, the uh, um, there are beads. Beads becomes a huge, huge um, industry in Europe to be wampum uh, um, for Native people on the on the east and the northeast. Um, so, yeah, there. There, I think one of the things I want this book to do is really slow history down a little bit for readers and say, look at look at these centuries in which. Um, you know, the way that Mohawks wanted a gun to be made changed how guns were made in Europe. Um, look at the ways in which you know women wanted a certain kind of needle changed uh, changed things, changed manufacturing, changed supply um, in Europe. Teapots too, I, I think you <laughs> Teapots, mentioned. Teapots, right? Yeah, Almost. that's right. Yeah, yeah, right, right. So, uh, so. You know, like people all over the 18th century world, uh, many Native Americans started importing teapots and 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 making tea um, for themselves. And then sometimes um, there were Native women who who made new kinds of pottery 
um, to for the European market. So some of them start making teapots for colonial markets because they know teapots are in demand. Teapots get broken. You can't always get one from Europe. Um, you might want a sort of uh, locally made <laughs> teapot as well, right? Um, so so in both directions, like the, there's these centuries of trade and exchange um, that are that are you know that in which both sides influence both sides influence the other. Well, one thing in local, pol uh, local native custom, traditionally among the Piscataways, we were discussing the, the role of uh, women in native societies. Among the Piscataways, it's the uh, female elders who traditionally pick the chief when there's a new chief to be selected. And, um, well, you talk in a number of ways about the important role of women in various tribes across the country. Uh, one of the other things that, um, you know, it took in the U.S. so long for us to give the right to vote to women. Uh, the other topic that you bring up from time to time is how relatively enlightened Native societies were up on gender issues. Mm -hmm. Would you like to say yeah, a little bit about that? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, there's this sort of, um, I mean, sometimes sort of looking outside one's own sort of, sort of the history, sort of I, I say, Patriarchy has been so so dominant on European and U.S. history that it's easy to imagine that is the natural way of societies for men to have more power than women. Um, and when you look at Native American history, it's obvious that that's not true. That's just something that got created in I don't European society or something earlier, you know, farther back and uh, um, in the old world than that. Um, Certainly not my expertise. I'm not going <laughs> to claim to know where patriarchy came from. Um, but to look at a place that that's not true of, that it's still gender, right, that still thinks women, you know, in, in the sort of centuries in the middle of this book, still think that women and men have very different roles in society, um, but imagine them as more complementary, um, as more like expertise, different expertise um, than... Um, than domination of one over the other. I think it's... Um, yeah, yeah, it's it's really different, and um, yeah, and maybe a little bit inspiring. Yeah. And what about the uh, adaptations for gender roles? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Would you, you know, uh, people may be aware of this, but it's taken us so long to get around to allowing for the variations in gender, but Native mm -hmm. Americans had in their society. Mm -hmm. um, a status that uh, took that into account. Would you like to say? Yeah. So, that? so many Native American societies had. They do have a. I mean, I just sort of generalize here. There, there's a binary of, of things that women do, and things that women are responsible for, and things that men are responsible for. Um, but also an acknowledgement that there may be individuals who maybe get born as one and really fit in with the other better. And so you know, it's hard to know how many, how common it is, because Europeans usually didn't notice it, and uh, um, Native Americans didn't usually point it out. Um, but occasionally, um, Native Americans would notice, we'd, uh, this seems like a man who's doing a woman's role. And, and, and Europeans are sh you know, shocked by that. Um, and it is just this little window into this, probably much larger than we can see from that um, Sort of possibility of, of, of individual people um, being able to find where they fit better, even within a pretty binary um, social system. Um, so there are examples like um, there's uh, one of the people I talk about among the Otham. The Oth I talk about the Otham who were, um, their nation was in what's today Arizona and Sonora and still is, um, still are. There's a woman named Maria Chona and she writes a, um, a memoir about the sort of late 19th century, early 20th century. And she says, um, there, there's a, um, like, one of the women was a man woman, and we really liked that she was so strong, right? Um, and so it's not, it seems not to be such a big deal, right? Well, we're going to get ready to do some questions, okay, but great, I did have great. one, one yeah, other please, thing yeah. that I want you to yeah. address, and that was some of the um, adaptations that the natives made uh, borrowing not always the best things mm -hmm. from the colonial uh, worldview of right. things. Right, yeah, yeah. So one of the chapters in the book is about the Cherokees in the early 19th century. And um, the Cherokees in the early 19th century, they write a constitution, they start publishing a newspaper, 
And some of the elite families among the Cherokees have plantations and own human beings and you know, have African um, enslaved people. And sometimes that story has been told as that they're just sort of, um, they got completely converted to the way people in the United, white people in the United States did and um, that uh, um, they assimilated, right, which is what white Americans often wanted to do with Native Americans. Um, but I talk about how, so, while that's going on at the same time, there are also many Cherokee households where the women, the Cherokee women are still the ones doing the farming, where they're not doing, um, they're not doing large scale cotton plantations. They're growing cotton, but cotton's being grown by Cherokee women. And um, this is another one of those cases where, where historians have sometimes looked at those documents and said, so the Cherokee Constitution gives only Cherokee men the vote. So it, 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 it is a sort of move toward the way white Americans see politics in that way. Um, but there were still female councils um, in the towns. There's still some sort of some women, more women's responsibilities over fields and, and housing, the way I talked about before. So it, it's not as dramatic a change as sometimes it's been portrayed as. But, but yeah, that the history of the 19th century, the 20th century is, is again one of adaptations and particularly the adaptations of, of living on a continent with a now demographically um, dominant um, white United States. Okay, uh, let's uh, open up the floor for questions if uh, we have, uh, here comes one. Okay, I can think of more if nobody else has any. Um, were there any connections between the, the Native Americans in the U.S. part of North America and Mexico? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and because they had very, they had very advanced civilizations. With right. So I would say they're all advanced, but the central Mexican society, like the Aztecs, the, Aztecs. the Mexicas, they don't have this period of, of de-urbanization, of decentralization ah. that, that um, societies do in Northern Mexico and what's now the United States and Canada. Um, so um, the, some the sort of cities, particularly of the Southwest, in um, you know of about a millennium ago or so, mm -hmm. um, archaeologists would always you know wondered for a long time about this very connection, uh, this very question, um, were because they could see some things that seemed to be in common in uh, sort of some of, the some of the cities of the Southwest, the American Southwest, um, with with the Aztecs and their predecessors in Central Mexico. Um, and they tried to figure out, you know, it's a long way across a lot of desert between. Right. It turns out uh, what had happened is that archaeologists in the U.S. had mostly focused on the United States. Sure. And archaeologists in Mexico had mostly central, focused on central Mexico, where the archaeology is, you know, there's a lot to do. There are cities in between, um, and they're only just now being discovered. And so there are some major cities um, all along the coast. I shouldn't say all along the coast, because we don't even know yet, because mm -hmm. there's some, you know, archaeology still needs to be done in all of these places. But there are cities in between, and so there pretty clearly was maybe not trade, like the, the, the theory was always that there was trade between Central Mexico and the American Southwest. It's probably more that, like, there were cities, and so there was a trade between there was trade between one of those more northern cities and what's now the United States. So because there's no border, right? There's no, sure. um, no difference. And then that um, that cities rose and fell over time and developed in different ways, and that there's just this huge history of urbanization of trade um, out there that. Uh, um, that archaeology hasn't done much with. Uh, I think that the native peoples today probably have uh, have a lot to say about. Yeah, because Mexico made, yeah. City. Oh, is there somebody? Oh, oh yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Hi. Thank you for this book. I actually have two questions, so I'm going to see if I can ask them briefly and then let you decide which one you want to answer. <laughs> They're both about teaching and your okay. book. Um, first off, uh, lately a lot more attention has been being paid to monograph length or, or um, books about the history of Native Americans, and I'm thinking of Ned Blackhawk, among others. Mm -hmm. And so one of the things I'm wondering is how do you see your book being distinguished from some of these others? But more important, how do you see this sort, this scholarship being 
incorporated into U.S. history courses in a way that does not just sort of stick a chapter on, but that rethinks the general history class as something that is centered on the place of the Americas and with Native Americans more at the center. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So. Yeah. No, that's that's As a great. Will. No, that's a great question. I think I can put them together. Yeah, I think. I mean, I, I would say some of the there is a generation of scholarship of more sort of single subject monographs that make possible books like this one and like Ned Blackhawk's book. Like we couldn't have written these. 20 years ago, maybe not even 10 years ago, because yeah, as you know, it just it, it it took all this this other work that to even be able to think about synthesizing a continent-wide history of this. I, th I think you know mine starts earlier and I think ends later. Um, there we haven't talked much about the sort of 20th century, but but it goes in you know sort of to today though more quickly. Um, and so I think yeah, I think these. This round of sort of synthesizing Native history on a broader scale is going to, I hope, help answer that second question of, of how do we tell a, how do we tell U.S. history that has Native America at its core, right? Because it has been too often taught as something, you know, kind of at the beginning, and then maybe it pops up at Indian removal, maybe it pops up at Wounded Knee, and then it's forgotten. And, you know, the greatest travesty of that is that, is that, it's not in the last few chapters of the book, as if Native Americans, Native nations aren't still around today. Um, and so I, th I teach a Native American history class, and it's one of the things I've always liked about the way it's structured. It, like, it existed before I ever taught it, but uh, I, I stepped into it because a colleague had created it. But um, it starts long ago, and it goes through today. It's not split at the Civil War or anything like that. And I think that's sort of, so if we can kind of merge that, that Native Americans were here long before Europeans were here. They had power long into the colonial period, and they're still here today. If then we can thread that through U.S. history, I think that's the way to do it. I am I am a co-author of a textbook, that's so I've been what working I was on. Because I yeah. used Foner, and I okay. remember yeah. when you were added on. And that was around the time that my colleagues decided that there was just too much material in Phoner and it was trying, time to go with something else, which... Oh, oh no. Oh, I'm sorry. It's, it's the it's same not, number of pages it used to be. Yeah, I know. <laughs> but, but yeah, and I think it, the, the answer is starting before Europeans got here with U.S. history um, and then just particularly making sure in 20th century that Native Americans are part of every story, that, that they aren't just, um, yeah, just of the past. Well, before we have the next question, I just wanted to make a comment because the the genius I found behind your book was the way that you tell the story, and it made me think of a this uh, uh, saying that comes generically out of Africa, which um, until the lion can tell its story, the hero of the hunt is always the hunter. And the wonderful thing about your book is that you're telling Native American history with deep research into what Native Americans were doing and what they said and what they recorded and and how they you know which was what's been missing from American history telling of the Native American story yeah yeah thank you and um, yeah and I think part of that is you know as we were just talking about this this uh, that lots of historians have been working on smaller pieces of this story for a while and another is a, a new sort of methodology a Native American and indigenous um, studies sort of methodology that um, Really pays attention to native knowledge today and what what um, what tribes, what native historians say about their past, even their distant past, um, which seems really obvious once you say it. Like, wouldn't you ask the you know the historian within a nation what they know about their nation's history before you even you know think about possibly writing it? Um, but um, it's not something historians did that much. And so, so one of the things I do in this book is in every chapter, even the ones that are about centuries before, um, I try to weave in um, you know, what that nation thinks today about that period of their past um, and how, how uh, sort of language and, and other things that are still around can help inform this, this longer history, that, that it's connected to the past um, at every stage. I had two questions. I wonder if you could say something about smallpox and other epidemics early on. And I had a second question. Yeah. I wonder if you found stories of women who did hunt, who did participate okay. in the hunt. Yeah, um, great questions. I'll the, the second one is, is simpler, and I'll say, I, um, 
I haven't, and I think it's because Europeans just wouldn't have noticed it. Um, and yeah, so, but I'm sure, I'm sure it was true. There are examples of women fighting. Um, Kathleen, yes. have you seen the movie Prey? I have not. Oh, well. Should I see it? <laughs> well, it's about a woman who, yeah. uh, it's another, it's in the Predator series. Yeah, yeah. The predator comes down near the tribe, uh, and a woman and her dog okay. defeat the Predator. All right, I will. I will Speaking of a female okay. hunter. I will see it. Okay, you convinced me. Um, uh, for, so for smallpox, I do, I do talk about disease quite a lot. Um, one of the things that sort of, this is a very recent sort of shift in historical writing about smallpox and other diseases. And for a while, um, there, mm -hmm. There were estimates of, you probably heard, you know, 90% die off of Native Americans and things like that. And one of the things that historians have been pointing to recently is that um, eh, the numbers are really lousy, right? We, we really don't know. We have no idea how many Native Americans there were in 1491. Um, and we have no idea how na many Native Americans there were in 1600. Um, so the the methodology, the sort of mathematical methodologies for getting to the sort of 90 very numerically specific and yet continentally vague idea that 90% of Native Americans died off or just based on almost no evidence at all. Um, often it was sort of one of the islands that the Spanish came to early and, um, and uh, sort of enslaved people and put them in the mines. Sometimes, yeah, people there, 90% of them died. But that isn't what would happen with, say, the Kiowas on the middle of the plains who never met a European. Um, um, and just, just finish that thought, the, um, what historians have been saying more and more and, and what I sort of follow in the book is that, um, it's colonialism, it's slavery, it's, uh, it's ripping people away from their homes, not allowing them to recover from diseases in the sort of quarantine means and the other sorts of ways that they had that were at least as good as Europeans medicines at the time, probably better, um, that's what leads to huge numbers of deaths, right? It's, it's, uh, it's the violence of colonialism itself um, rather than, I mean, there certainly are times where smallpox is bad, and, but that happens in all, in all over the world. It's not unique to Native America. Hi, uh, how are you? I, how <laughs> so are you good doing? To see you. Uh, I, I wonder, you're a historian, of course, and, and uh, so you're going back a thousand years. Mm -hmm. Can you take it a couple hundred years forward in your mind? I mean, is tribal nationhood a permanent fixture now of the American Commonwealth. Well, I should ask you that, Mr. Chair. Well, I, I, <laughs> he, is I, a, he is a tribal I, lawyer. I it, is. it seemed like a you gift from him? God when the, yes. when the Nixon message came out and the Johnson message. And yeah. that I, as you know, I've been working. Yes, I, you know a lot more than I know. <laughs> to, to make right. it permanent. But yeah. I'm, I'm always. Uh, I'm always skittish about it. I'm worried yeah, about it. And yeah. I, I don't know how much. Yeah. You I mean, share that yeah, story. there have been some pretty big Supreme Court decisions that seem to be moving in the way of recognizing tribal sovereignty and moving it oh, forward. Yeah. As we know, of course, the Supreme Court can always move in the other direction. And well, uh, Justice Gorsuch <laughs> is, a, is a godsend. He really is. <laughs> oh, my God. Yeah, yeah. I thought about asking him to, to blurb the book, and then uh, my editor said, everybody will think you're a conservative. So yeah. I'm like, that's not okay. But, but, um, Maybe it, this is an even longer view, but I really, I mean, maybe sort of U.S. dominance will be a blip in the long, long history of North America. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Maybe we'll split up into various things and some of them will be tribes <laughs> All <right. laughs> because they're ready. Like nobody else is ready to replace the United States. I mean, there are some people who would like to, but the, no, there are no right smaller sovereignties that are ready to replace the United States except tribes and they're ready. That's crazy. All right. Well, good Thank to see you. you. Well, I, I thought mine was a really simple question, but based on your comments about figuring out the mortality from epidemics and so forth, um, I just w I'm interested in the urban era mm -hmm. and what what were the numbers for the largest yeah. cities like yeah. Kahuki, which are Kahuka, C A. K O H I A. Uh, That's a good spelling in my head. But um, so, Cahokia had in its center about twelve thousand people, um, and then on the edges, you know, prob towns that had not 
as mon many as that, but uh, mm. but added up to to more than that. Um, uh, these yeah, these numbers as you as you forecast, these numbers are shaky, right? Mm -hmm. um, there are societies in the Southwest where there are multiple cities and connected. A lot a lot of these have sort of suburbs, I guess, that are connected to them. Right. And if you sort of count them in, you start to get into the tens. Um, in some cases, maybe up to a hundred thousand. So these you know they're not they're not huge, mm. but for the early for, for the medieval era, right. they're you know they're, they're on par with European cities. Now they don't come anywhere close to Chinese cities, right? Those are the biggest in the world, right? right. Uh, much much bigger, but in the tens of thousands, yeah. Mm -hmm. And there's still plenty of people who aren't living in cities, but may have sort of um, satellite towns that are connected to them. Right. Right. Okay. Thanks. Oh, you're welcome. Hello there. Um, so we've been talking a lot tonight about things like uh, power, survival, and identity. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, there's a great term survivance that's you know been uh, you know t coined recently and brought up. You know, David Troyer uses it in in his book, yeah, right? Yeah. Um, in terms of what's going on, though, you know, we're talking about power exchanges within you know, places like the native ground, the middle ground, that mm -hmm. kind of area, right? Um, but what about when you know we talk about uh, tribes retaining their identities, but there are tribes that have almost been invaded from within, right? There's a cultural sort of economy going on, especially in these places of frontier violence, right? You know, people are trading for weapons, mm -hmm. they're creating allies, you know, not just indigenous people with indigenous people, but, you know, with various different Anglo countries mm -hmm. and European countries. So what about when the cultural exchange goes wrong, when you have people invading the tribal circle, usurping traditional sort of like knowledge holders, mm -hmm. like Jesuit priests mm -hmm. up in Maine, mm -hmm. and like down in Louisiana as well, you know, mm -hmm. um, it must be a hard story to tell when you know giving power to those pe to those people especially who become more uh, Christianized mm -hmm. right and mm -hmm. decide to assimilate in mm -hmm. certain areas mm -hmm. yeah yeah that's a great question and so the term that, that, that they mentioned is um, uh, survivance sort of this, um, which is portmanteau of survival and resistance like that survival itself is a resistance to colonialism um, and particularly survival of, of sovereign nations and so yes it's a much more complicated history we haven't even mentioned warfare which there totally was like, like, like just yeah um, one of the things I, 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 I always say if I I'm, and I forgot to do here, like forgetting going too far into sort of possibly romanticizing these political systems, like these um, new town squares that were created in the Southeast to, um, uh, to for all the people to be able to gather in and, and talk about major decisions and all this. Um, they're also terrific places to hang up scalps of your enemies. Like that, that was a major tradition. To, so let's, it, plenty of violence, uh, plenty of warfare and enemy enemies, right? Um, just because there were certain, just because the reciprocity in peaceful relationships doesn't mean there aren't also relationships of war. Um, but then to get to sort of the more, more of the question of, of Christianizing and such. Um, I think that certainly happens sometimes. Um, one of the sort of messages I think I'd like sort of at least on a larger scale to give is that um, change and adaptation doesn't make people stop, you know, being Native American or stop, particularly stop being their particular Native nation. Um, and so many, I think most Native Americans today would call themselves Christians of one kind or another. Um, the Native American church is, is, is very alive and well in many Native communities, which combines both sort of kind of generalized sort of plains related native traditions, um, Christianity and traditions that are particular to a particular tribe, you know, depending on where the Native American church is. Um, so while there certainly have over the centuries been many, many missionaries who wanted to destroy native culture and replace it entirely um, with Christianity, um, I think they were less successful than we would say. Uh, successful in making Christians out of Native Americans, um, but unsuccessful in making them no longer um, I don't know, part of their own culture or part of their own nat nationality, as long as we recognize that it can change over time. Yeah, they didn't count on that spirited uh, resistance. To <laughs> That's right, Jesus. <laughs> Hi. Um, I wanted to ask just sort of generally about um, uh, if you had just anything to say about uh, the tribes that are not 
federally recognized. So they didn't know the title of the book is Native Nations, and there's, you know, more than 500 federally recognized tribes. But we were mentioning, you know, the Piscataway, who lived right here on these very lands, and they're not federally recognized. So what is, you know, nationhood if, you know, the colonizing government isn't sanctioning it? Right, yeah. Well, my easy question is, it's still nationhood, right? Um, and so I do, I do talk about you know today's state recognized tribes today. So for those of you who don't know, the there are you know, five five hundred, almost six hundred now federally recognized tribes in the United States, but especially on the East Coast and other coasts that also face colonialism early. You know, around New Orleans, on the Louisiana coast, in California, and up the um, there are. Native nations with long histories in the places that uh, that colonizers came to early and hard. So we've been talking a lot about sort of these centuries of time for adaptation. Um, you know, North Carolina's Virginians, uh, you know, DC's native populations did not have that time, right? They were um, colonized so early and surrounded so early, and yet still existing today as, you know, as, you know, whatever anybody wants to call them, incorporated, corporate, you know, incorporated entities, or I would say nations, um, just shows how determined those ancestors were to, against all odds, against violence, against um, assimilation efforts like nobody else had to suffer through, um, to retain their communities, that's just it is both, you know, heroic and um, and then appalling. Then that we have this system that says the federal government, who was responsible for so much of the worst colonialism, is the one who gets to say who Native nations are today. Um, I don't know a way out of that system, but I think that at the very least we should recognize the corrupt nature of it. Um, that, uh, you know, they're sort of you know, North Carolina, Virginia are the, are the, um, the places where I'm more, rec more um, familiar with the state recognized tribes. Um, and they're just, you know, they've always been their own communities. They know who they are. Um, and uh, I think, yeah, back to, back to Mr. Chambers' question, I think uh, one of the big questions for the coming 50 years or so is going to be, um, what are other Native Americans going to do and what are non-Native Americans going to do about the real fact of the lasting power of, of state-recognized Native nations and unrecognized Native nations? Um, I mean, the Pamunkeys. The Pamunkeys are the descendants of Pocahontas. You know, you don't get any more clearly Native than that, but they only got federal recognition in, like, 1990 something? No, 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 no. It's in it's in the 21st century. It's, it's like 2015. Um, so, yeah, there's a lot of work to do there. Uh, but I do I um, I do talk a lot about about that in the book. Yeah. Thank you for asking. I might point out that um, your book is not only very readable because the stories you tell are so accessible, but um, there's over 100 pages of references. <laughs> so you don't have to read those. <laughs> no, you don't have to read them for anyone who's teaching and wants to get into the sources yeah. of a lot of your information, yeah. it's all in there. Yeah. And yeah. I think that's really admirable as well. Thank you. And I would say if anybody is, if, if there's anybody who is teaching um, and wants any of those primary sources, I'd, I'd be glad to send them to people. Do you have a question? No, I was oh. excited about primary. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, it's uh, getting to be, oh, oh, we have another. Oh, right, yeah. And so I'm yeah. just wondering if you could explain yeah. um, maybe the difference between mm -hmm. those two. Yeah. And yeah. Do you use the term settler colonialist mm -hmm. in this? And what yeah. do you think is important about the difference? Yeah, thank you for asking that. And I do use the word settler colonialism, but, but I really, I only use it for times when settlers really outnumber Native people. So they're, and that means when I talk about colonialism more generally, often it's you know it's more aspirational. Like the Europeans want to control Native people and don't succeed in it. When it turns to settler colonialism, 
and it, it was just a demographic change when when the United States has, or you know, when Jamestown has, depending on you know how big you're looking at and what period you're looking at, has the numbers to completely outnumber local Native people. Um, then yeah, that's when I start to use the word settler colonialism as a you know a. And I should also say, you know, for those who don't know, it, it, settler colonialism is not only sort of this overwhelming number of settlers that that changes the power dynamics, but then it's also this immediate afterward erasure of native presence, native ownership of, of the place that the settler colonists have just taken, right? Um, so some of this, uh, so one example when we're talking about mounds, you know, saying that, oh, they must've been built by somebody else, that sort of settler colonialism, the, the sort of more philosophical part of settler colonialism in action. Like Native Americans really didn't, eh, they didn't really possess this place. Um, you know. Okay, well, uh that's going to, we're going to close things up. Thank you very much for very 